Good evening. I am grateful to the organizers uh, of this very important program for uh, having invited me to deliver this special lecture on the topic uh, creative writing. Uh, as a practicing creative writer, uh, this topic is close to my heart. I have been a creative writer since uh, almost three decades and uh, I have been writing poetry uh, and fiction and uh, critical uh, material uh, and critical research papers I have been writing since more than three decades now. And uh, this important program uh, with all the participants out there uh, listening to me, I think many of them are also practicing creative writers and uh, this discussion, this uh, conversation, this discourse uh, may probably be helpful for all of them. Uh, I expect uh, interaction. I do not have any PowerPoint presentation. I do not have any uh, paper to read out. I would share my experiences as a creative writer with you all here today. Uh, before I get into uh, the discussion uh, about creative writing, my basic question to all of you uh, and of course to myself is, can creative writing be taught? Can anyone actually teach you creative writing? The answer is both yes and no. Uh, creative writing is uh, something in birth and uh, it's like music in the egg of a cuckoo, as the poet would say. And uh, I would say, as a, as a teacher of English, literature and language, uh, my proposition is if you are a creative writer, if you understand uh, creative writing, if you have creativity in you, then probably uh, a course like this on creative writing can brush up your talent. You can learn the technicalities of creative writing, the basic principles of creative writing through this kind of a training program where I see that more than 60 participants are here discussing their poetry, their art and this is a very important program. It's a welcome fact that you all are talking about the challenges you are facing. Well, yes, as a creative writer, even I face many challenges every time I sit down to write in a creative medium that is so challenging in itself. Uh, well, uh, in the beginning I will talk about uh, poetry and uh, you may put it uh, how to write poetry. You experiment with your poems, so do I. But also, there are a few technicalities that probably a poet should know before you get into uh, the task of writing poetry. Understanding the poetic devices like rhetoric and prosody is very, very important, isn't it? And you have to understand the structural, grammatical, rhythmic, metrical, verbal and visual elements in poetry. They are essential tools and a poet should create rhythm, internal rhythm and rhyme and the poet should give importance to a poem's meaning and uh, its intensity, its mood and its feeling. To write a poem, you should first of all feel it, isn't it? There are several steps to uh, to writing poetry and uh, uh, let us categorize those into say eight steps of writing a poem. The first step for, of writing a poem is uh, you have to learn what your poem is about. And the next is you have to understand the purpose of writing your poem. Every piece of creative writing should have a purpose and I call that witness literature. Like in the court of law, the witness plays a very important role to give a new turn and a new direction to the course of, of the case. Similarly, in the process of social change, 
towards a more positive and a more inclusive society the poet should play the role of a witness i have taken it from nabin godimer we we call it witness literature and i call it witness poetry so you have to understand the purpose of writing mm. your poems isn't it and then you have to choose a subject a mature poet would say that one can write poetry on anything under the sun on any particular subject well i agree you can write a poem on anything for example you can write a poem on this glass of water isn't it or or anything for that matter but then while choosing a subject you have to also think about social mobility literature you have to ask yourself is my poem going to make any social change or is my poem going to you know influence a couple of people in the society otherwise only art for art sake poetry for the sake of poetry becomes nothing more than word juggling one need not be a poet specifically a poet need not be a juggler of words and then the next step is brainstorming do that brainstorming with yourself and sometimes you have to do the brainstorming with your peer groups maybe a group of poets like this now look at you 60 people sitting there writing poetry listening to me talking to me having a conversation about your subjects your challenges so this is what you call brainstorming isn't it so do some kind of brainstorming with your peer groups when you write poetry and then uh, next which is a uh, next step which is very very important you have to choose a format for the poem and then next is you should write one line at a time poetic lines are very important one line at a time not like prose or fiction where you can even write one paragraph at a time and in a poetic stanza three line four line five line stanzas are there each line is very very important because poetry has to be short and simple mostly so so choose your lines very carefully and then uh write the rest of the stanza i mean the uh, the poetic lines and then the final step which is really very important is edit your poem you have to be a very ruthless rigorous editor of yourself you know when i write my poems and in the first uh, step when i start writing it uh the the rough draft of the poems they are so different from the fair drafts sometimes even they are totally different only the spirit may remain the language of the poem may entirely change uh padmasri jayant mahapatra the poet i was taking an interview with him along back when i was doing my phd on his poetry and uh, he showed me some of his um, edited poems so the first draft and the final draft there was a sea change a lot of editing was there so uh, you know i would recommend you become your own editor edit your poetry very very carefully your language and your content sensitive poetry content with sensitive issues should be even taken more care you know and uh, recently you know i i received um, a, a phd thesis from some university i received and uh, a candidate had done her phd on uh, the unpublished and the published poetry of uh, some great masters of english literature and i saw that uh, uh, the candidate has did uh, the person had taken all the pain to visit uh the places of the dead poets and uh, somehow managed to collect the original manuscripts of uh, those poems those important poems that we read today with great interest and then she made a comparative study of uh, the published version and the first drafts and uh, she looked at uh, those poems with psychoanalysis and uh, as a theoretical tool and also she looked at those uh, from reader response uh, theory and she tried to prove that uh, a poet's mind works in a very different manner uh, 
द फर्स्ट ड्राफ्ट वॉज मोर इमोशनल मोर सेंसिटिव मोर इम्पल्सिव and the final draft was something that is published the published poems that we read today the final drafts uh, are so very mature so different from uh, the way the poet had conceived those so that was a part of the thesis and it was very interesting <laughs> but you know i ended up um, asking the scholar not to do that to me i said if somebody if uh, once i know more if somebody manages to collect the first drafts or the unpublished drafts of my literature and then uh, publishes those uh, and presents those to the world then probably uh, my spirit will be offended because you know a poet may not like that whatever was the first draft uh, uh, may not come out uh, to public the poet might the poet may not have appreciated that but anyway uh, this is what is uh, uh, research so uh, and uh, and the researchers try to find out uh, the nuances of uh, the poetry and also poets like new critics would do and uh, this kind of research is coming up anyway i leave that to you to decide if you would like to look at the lives of the poets or their poetry and uh, when you write your poetry uh, you have to also consider the various kinds of poetry there are uh different types of poetry like narrative dramatic and lyrical lyrical poetry mostly romantic poetry we have been reading them and uh, they are uh, you know basically lyrical poetry is uh, the, the kind of poems that uh, have rhythm and rhyme and metrical patterns and you can sing those uh, with the help of the musical instruments that is called uh, lyrical poetry so uh, many people write lyrical poetry even i am a great supporter of uh, lyrical poetry and then uh, there is dramatic poetry you know dramatic monologues you have been teaching those to your students what is a dramatic monologue that's it that. and then narrative epic poetry like my poetry collection sita it's a long poem in 25 cantos where uh, i am talking about uh, the character sita from ramayan in uh, 25 cantos it's it's about a progressive independent free thinking very contemporary uh, sita a woman who is an eco feminist who doesn't brood cry or complain about uh, whatever happens in your life in her life rather she is a character who takes life in her stride and uh, she serves the society she serves the she is an educationist she is a great cook she is a great mother so that kind of a narrative i have created out of the character uh, sita from ramayan so narrative poetry uh, uh, has a story mostly so you know like sita like uh, draupadi like so many you know uh, iliad uh, and odyssey and even uh, poems from our indian epics so they are narrative poetry we will come to that in detail in due course of this uh, discussion now when you talk about uh, the different kinds of poetry we can also think about the elements of poetry there are so many elements of uh, a poem like the structure you know the form and uh, the speaker like i am the speaker when i am the poet i am the speaker i am speaking to my readers through my poetry through my poetic medium and then the sound devices and uh, the figurative language the rhyme the meter the theme tone mood and syntax and diction there are so many things that a poet should consider while writing poetry and in case you are a creative writer and poetry is your creative medium then please take care of these things i can see that uh, so you some of you have raised your hands to ask me questions please type your questions here in due course of the discussion i am going to respond to those and uh, finally after uh, my discussion is over we will take up all your questions and we will have a very important and interesting interactive session with you half of this session will go to interactions uh, please be sure of that well now uh, let me get back to the poetic devices in the beginning i told you that if you want to write poetry then you have to also understand the poetic devices 
now poetic devices are uh, something uh, very important very critical to understand like you know uh, anaphora you have to understand that as a poetic device and that describes a poem that repeats the same phrase in the beginning of each stanza repetition is a technique in poetry you might have also experienced that if you are a poet isn't it sometimes as poets we tend to repeat some lines lines of importance lines that we want to be emphasized so anaphora is that technique in poetry where you repeat quite a few things and uh, uh, in uh, indian fiction uh, arundhati roy i have read uh, all her works and then uh, she uses the te- the technique of repetition very interestingly she repeats the lines here and there which really makes sense every single time she does it so please learn to repeat your lines wisely not like uh, redundantly rather you should learn how to repeat your lines very wisely so that uh, that the lines have their own worth and value isn't it and then next you have to understand something you have to understand is conceit huh? a conceit essentially is uh, uh, an extended metaphor and you understand what is a simile what is a metaphor so a conceit is an extended metaphor you have to understand that and then apostrophe use of that in a poem it's very important if you put the apostrophe at the wrong place it can completely change the meaning of your poem so learn to use your apostrophe very very carefully and then metonymy and metaphor and enjambment and zeugma and uh, as i said repetition so these are the poetic devices that you should understand now what is a zeugma if i tell you that uh, uh, she broke his uh, uh, bike and his heart okay if a woman has broken the heart of a person and you say that she broke his bike and also she broke his heart now heart is important okay she broke his heart that is important but by saying that she broke uh, the bike the two thoughts come together uh, in a grammatical sense but uh, uh, you actually mean Uh, that the heart is important the woman broke the heart of the man isn't it so poets use such techniques uh, and uh, maybe we can put it as a part of uh, um, say the poetic liberty poetic liberty is important and then uh, by enjambment you mean that it's a continuation of a phrase or uh, you know a clause and uh, uh, you know it's it's the it's the continuation for example in the poem the good morrow for example the poet john dun he uh, uses enjambment in a very interesting manner he says i wonder by my troth uh, what thou and i and then the line ends there but the next line continues did still we loved so thou and i then the line ends and then the next line begins with did till we loved so here what happens is it's a continuation i you and i did it's a sentence if i say that what you and i did so it's the sentence is complete here but in the enjambment the poet will break you and thou and i one sentence here and the next sentence is did till we loved and this question you know i have faced this several times in my poetry classes mostly the students would ask me ma uh, the poet could have completed the sentence here why did he break it and the answer is very very complex sometimes the poets try to create a different mood and a different mode in the next line in the second line after they abruptly after the suddenly break the first line without the need for it they break the first line and then they go to the second line probably they try to change the mood and the mode of the poem so enjambment gives that kind of an effect to poetry and now uh, before we talk about uh, all the poetic devices and all the technicalities of poetry i'm reminded about uh, some of the interesting definitions of poetry in order to understand uh, poetry as a creative medium like philip sidney's definition of poetry he says is a is an art of imitation you know he talks about aristotle he says 
poetry is an art of imitation and uh, that is to say uh, ex in expressing in counterfeiting or in figurative speech to speak metaphorically a speaking picture you know a poem is a speaking picture a speaking picture with this and to teach and delight i like these two uh, words poetry is basically to teach and delight it's not just to delight right it should also have the capacity to teach to to give you something important for your life so poetry is a teaching and also poetry is a delightful medium for sir philip sidney uh, i so agree with him and uh, like this eliot would say that poetry is not a turning loose of emotions but it is uh, an escape from emotions well i have my reservations with this uh, of course poetry should not be a turning loose of emotions and it should not be only you know an emotional overflow of uh, of powerful feelings rather poetry should uh, uh, have a proper structure and a way of presentation uh, so i and i accept this line but then coming to the next part of uh, the definition it is not the expression of the personality but an escape from the personality well i don't think that any poet can actually escape from his or her personality while writing poetry if you are a poet your personality will automatically come in you know if you are an optimist if you are a pessimist if you are you know you love, you have a sense of humor i love humor studies is coming up in a big way lot of poets are writing uh, humorous poetry and i am one i do believe in humorous poetry romantic poetry definitely though um, most of my poems have an inclination to mythology and folklore uh, as a folklorist but also i give lot of importance to the use of humor in in literature in poetry so uh, the when he still it says that it's uh, it's not an es expression of personality but an escape from personality uh, i have doubts there that how can you probably escape from your own personality while writing poetry again he uh, contradicts himself when he says that um, i will quote uh, but of course only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from these things stop quote so those who have control over their emotions and personality uh, can uh, only you know take care to to get out of extreme emotion expression of extreme emotion in their poetry well probably here we can conclude that uh, uh, in order to attain an, a universal approach in your poetry you have to take care of your personality the turning loose of your personality you may have to take care of uh, you know your emotions and present those in a more organized manner and uh, i so agree with shelley when he says that uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world yes they are and uh, poetry and politics uh according to shelley it's it's an assertion that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world and uh, it's the clearest illustration of his belief that imaginative practice and political activism were intricately intertwined yes so the personal is political in poetry in art and literature probably this is what he meant when he said that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world and political activism and uh, imaginative practice these two things come together and they are intricately intertwined when he said that probably he meant it and in sir philip sidney's an apology for poetry uh, uh, he gives very very important points to uh, the creative writers particularly the poets now why should someone put an apology for poetry why should poetry apologize in the first place and apologize to whom you know this is an answer to uh, stephen uh, gorson's the school of uh, uh, poetry where he talks about um, uh, how poets are manipulative and uh, he says he says that uh, poet and the poets uh, they Uh, they preach a immortality immorality you know unethical things he says that and sir philip sidney he defends that he puts an apology for poetry by saying that poetry doesn't teach anything unethical rather poetry teaches and preaches ethics and morality 
this is what it means and uh, if you are creative writers and uh, if you are poets then reading this seminal work is very very important and imperative for you isn't it now coming to uh, my poetry mm, uh, you have invited me here to talk about my poetry in particular uh, while writing poetry uh, uh, I recall uh, Eliot's uh, traditional and individual talent, no doubt. But anyway, in this context, I like to quote one of my own poems from uh, my poetry collection, The Other Voice. The title of the poem is uh, Poetry, uh, quote unquote. When words dance on my pen's tongue, I feel language is a flooded river, not to be hindered, discarded, and poetry flows from the hedges of the mind, breaking the parapets. So when I say poetry flows, breaking the parapets, I definitely allow my emotions to overflow, my emotions to come out like flooded rivers. And... Uh, about the mentors uh, of uh, my poetry, uh, well, I would prefer to talk about uh, many poets and writers who have inspired me, like I said, poet Jant Mahapatra and, uh, uh, you know, creative writer Manoj Das, though he was not a poet, but he was a critic, a folklorist and a writer of fiction and also uh, a philosopher. He has deeply influenced me and uh, uh, my uh, supervisor late Professor Niranjan Mohanty, he was a great poet and uh, beyond Odisha there were many poets in the pan-Indian level, uh, many Indian English writers and also from Odisha, poet Bibhu Pari, he has influenced me. Now coming to uh, world literature, writers, uh, poets like Homer, Virgil and Dante, I have been reading a lot of classical literature and among the romantics and the moderns, I read Keats, Shelley, Byron, Wordsworth, Tennyson, T.S. Eliot, Emerson, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, Robert Frost, Ezra Pound and Sexton, Leslie Mervyn Silko, uh, Kamla Das, Nessa Mesical, A.K. Ramanujan, R. Parthasarathy, Adrian Rich, Sylvia Platt, Caroline Kaiser and many more, many, many poets. I have been a great reader of poetry. Well, my suggestion to all the participants here would be, uh, in order to be a poet, first read classical literature and then read modern literature, lots of poetry you have to read to understand uh, the minds of the poets and also understand the technicalities of writing poetry like poetic devices and read literary theories. Without theory, you cannot be a good poet. The poetry theory symbiosis is very, very important for me. Uh, when I am taking my poetry classes and I talk poetry, the theorist in me definitely comes out. I theorize poetry anyone's poetry and when I take my uh, uh, theory classes uh, uh, it's the other way around when I take the theory classes the poet in me comes out the poet in me uh, enjoys that uh, theory class okay so uh, you all are teachers of English literature and uh, doing this creative writing course and you are trying to understand the technicalities of writing poetry so for you understanding literary theory is definitely very very important isn't it and uh, do you believe that a poet can be made yes a poet can be made a poet can be created if there is some poetic sensibility in him or her then by understanding the technicalities the nuances the devices of poetry uh, probably uh, a poet can be made a poet can be created it's not absolutely impossible right and about the choice of language uh, I am from Odisha I read a lot of Odia literature and uh, Odisha is the land I live love and I have deep bonding with my own literature and language in Odisha but I write in English that is my creative medium that is my language of comfort and uh, uh, you know Indian writing in English uh, it has come a long way uh, the poets uh, of the, the post independence period or even pre independence period they created this historiography of Indian English poetry where I belong to 
and uh, without my understanding of those great masters like Thurudat and Sarojini Naidu or say Rabindranath Tagore or you know uh, all those poets um, during uh, the British period and immediately after uh, India's independence, the kind of poetry they wrote, they created the historiography of uh, all uh, of us uh, contemporary Indian English poets and uh, while I deeply uh, respect them, regard them in honor of uh, uh, Kamala Das's poem, uh, an introduction. I have written a poem. Uh, the title of the poem is Bridge in Making. And this was uh, a poem which I wrote as an emotional uh, overflow, I would say, when somebody in some conference uh, of Indian English poetry, in the women's poetry conference, uh, somebody asked me, why do you write uh, in English? You are an Odia. And then my answer was, uh, I would quote my poem, The Bridge in Making. It's one of my seminal poems. Uh, quote, I write in English to free my words being imprisoned in the arms of the heart, be it Odishan or Indian, but it's out of this earth and wind. I am Indian, Odia by birth, with witty's brown skin, dark eyes. I'm just a poet. English or no English, my turbulence filled with the muse. So this is definitely in honor of Kamala Das, the person who created the historiography of Indian women uh, poets and I belong to that tradition. And uh, uh, also in one of uh, the Indian women poets uh, conference, uh, a small little girl, she asked me a question that, ma'am, why do women poets cry so much? I was really shocked. I started self-questioning. Do I actually cry in my poetry? Do we actually cry in our poetry? Well, my answer to that uh, little girl was, see, probably women have more of existential issues to face. Uh, that is why they are so true to their words and they write the truth of the reality of life. That was my vague answer to her question. But then back home, I thought, why do women poets, in fact, why do poets write about death and loneliness so much? Well, uh, it's complex. The answer is very complex. The feeling of solitude is often a problem and a paradox for a sensitive, creative mind. You may understand that because most of you are poets sitting here listening to me. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it's a necessary, uh, uh, you know, precondition for many uh, that uh, we narrate some kind of perceived state of existence. We do that in our poetry. On the other hand, it's a kind of uh, philosophical understanding of life. And uh, a coming to terms with uh, certain realities of life at both personal and uh, you know universal levels. But then again, if you can uh, strip death of its fearful aspect, you do not fear death anymore. Remember the poem. Uh, you know, you you know you take you get into death once, and then you forget about the terrific, uh, you, know, you know the dangerous aspects of life and then you don't fear death anymore uh, and then uh, if you can uh, strip death of its fearful aspects it's often uh, the other side of ecstasy if you understand that death is inevitable one day it will definitely come we have to accept it with optimism not with pessimism but with optimism but with uh, positivity then you understand the ecstasy of life you understand that the present is very important. There is no future. I I need not wait to be happy tomorrow because who has seen tomorrow? Probably there is no tomorrow. Probably there is no next moment. There is no next minute. If you realize that and then you accept it with positivity, with optimism, then probably, you know, you, you will... Uh, understand the ecstasy of the present moment and you may love life even more. So this is the theme of my poetry collection, Zero Point. I have taken the idea from the Upanishad, the idea of zero. Uh, zero is the end point and also the beginning of anything and everything. Zero is the largest number, zero is the smallest number. If you have understood the zero of your life, then you add value to life. 
if you go on putting zero to the left side then that becomes null and void you know and the, the zero has no meaning but if you put zero to the right side of your life then it becomes 10 and then 100 then 1000 and then you know 10000 the, the value grows on and by zero uh, the reader now might mean that you add love you add optimism you add flexibility you add plurality you add more relationships love of people love of humanity love of nature of animals of flora and fauna you add more zeros to your life then your life becomes worth living then your life becomes more beautiful so zero point talks about the ecstasy of life because there is death so maybe this is how poets do understand uh, the the meaning of uh, life because they understand the value of death isn't it now a uh, lot of uh, poets also write confessional poetry uh, in indian uh, poetry scenario a lot of poets uh, write confessional poetry i guess you tend to think that uh, confessional poetry is not required because why should you talk so much of truth when life can be beautiful otherwise no i think confessional poetry is very very important because first of all you confess things to yourself as a poet you are not a word juggler rather you are here to contribute something to the society contribute something to social change and through confessional poetry you face truth for yourself first and then you create truth for your readers and about the future of indian english poetry lot of people uh, do their research on indian english poetry so uh, mostly they talk about uh, the future of indian english poetry i think uh, it's something that uh, uh, that is very important indian uh, we don't ask this question about uh, future of american poetry future of british poetry then why do we ask the question of future of indian english poetry english is the official language of india and uh, in the nep document uh, a lot of importance has been given to all the 22 languages of india also the six classical languages of india and apart from that it has been clearly mentioned that uh, english is the official language of uh, many states of india and we cannot do without uh, this language so if english is our medium of instruction then there is no question about the future of indian english poetry and uh, the future is very bright no doubt about it and uh, in order to be a great poet or to be a good poet uh, you have to think deep and feel with honesty and when it comes to expression read literature of your genre that has uh, preceded you and uh, my poetic faith is uh, you can say that it's a it's a cross between the wordsworthian and eliotian stream of thought and uh, the impressions that they have left for me are very very important and uh, the medium of expression that uh, uh, creates a mark for yourself is also very very important classical literature to me is uh, uh, a treasure house and uh, one has to read a lot of classical literature a thorough knowledge of one's milieu flora and fauna ecology is very very important to write good poetry honesty is the key word understanding the technicalities of poetry is the key word and uh, also uh, you know being be true to yourself so that you can uh, write good poetry and uh, uh, there are varieties of poems like uh, one is haiku isn't it it's a japanese technique there are so many techniques of writing poetry so many varieties of writing poetry i would just talk about the haiku uh, because now we have to also talk about uh, uh, fiction as creative writing so i would quote one haiku from my poetry collection collected poems of nandini sahu which is published very recently uh, there is one poem uh, sleep three lines haiku is a three line poem um, quote my sleep and sleeplessness play hide and seek full stop is someone awake in me stop quote 
so three lines and they are self sufficient they they don't have to depend on any other line as a predecessor or as a successor and uh, poetry is a beautiful creative medium uh, it adds beauty rhythm and rhyme to your mind and heart great poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world undoubtedly so uh, now let's go to uh, writing fiction after that we will take questions from uh, all of you uh, i can see that a lot of you uh, many of you have already typed your questions here i can see the questions i will take all the questions one by one uh, after uh, we talk about uh, you know the uh, the writing of fiction uh, writing fiction yes i do enjoy writing stories and uh, um, i have published my story collection recently uh, shedding the metaphors it was launched by uh, the honorable education minister sri dharmendra pradhan ji uh, last month and also it was launched in the vice regal lodge of delhi university by the vice chancellor of delhi university uh, professor yogesh singh and both the book launches were uh, very interesting you might have seen those youtubes well uh, i and in the book shedding the metaphors uh, i have taken 12 short stories uh, over the years i have written those stories i have written more than 24 25 stories and in this collection i have taken 20, uh, 12 only uh rest others will follow uh, in the near future there will be another collection of stories uh, uh you know as far as the themes go i um, the themes of my short stories go or my fictions uh, my go uh i believe in the essence of uh, that the essence of a short story is often a simple expression is of a small happening some people around us who impress us by a certain characteristic traits in them and uh, big and small uh, incidents of our lives and so on i find that uh, uh, the the staple of my stories uh, in everyday life uh, are uh, things that that influence me that impact me i see somebody very interesting i see some lives which influence me and then i add some fiction to those and then i write stories there are several human beings who have been a, a, who have created a lasting impression on me so much so that their memories have remained with me and they have come out as short stories uh, at the cost of sounding personal and autobiographical sometimes i pour my character into the my character traits into the characters surrounding me my stories may not be necessarily basically about me technically they are about uh, about someone else but then in the absence of uh, knowing those people very closely only knowing their stories sometimes i tend to pour my personality into them uh, i really cannot avoid doing that and that is the risk of sounding personal uh, but then probably uh, in due course of time uh, the style the technique uh, might change whether in my poetry or in my short stories i have always believed and practiced uh, writing simple thoughts and uh, about that my readers who can relate they can relive and find uh, correlatives objective correlatives with uh, you know the incidents with the episodes and the thoughts uh, of their own lived experiences for example my story uh, in the collection uh, shedding the metaphors the last story which is a memoir being god's wife many people uh, after reading that story being god's wife they get back to me and they tell me that ma'am when i read that story i actually thought about my father okay that is the story about my parents and being god's wife i'm talking about uh, my mother who who thought that she was always god's wife of my father who was an educationist in rural orissa who had the audacity who had the conviction of educating six girl children and the incidents the happenings in their life in the lives of my parents i have written those i have penned those in the memoir being god's wife uh, that is available online also please go through that and uh, in case you have any questions you can uh, discuss with me now uh, coming to uh, uh, creative writing uh, this session creative writing uh, with special reference to writing fiction 
I will talk about the technicalities of writing fiction here. Um, before I get into that, uh, as a creative writer, I often ask this question to myself. Uh, for whom does the novel speak? Especially Indian English fiction. Before, uh, uh, well, in this case, I will I will quote Mulkaraj Anand, who had raised a somewhat similar concern, similar concern in one of his essays he had written. This is about uh, an, an introduction to the collection of his Indian fairy tales, and he wrote, I will quote him, quote, the stories contained in this volume were told to me by my mother and my aunts during my childhood. The primary inspiration to retell them, therefore, came from the nostalgic memories of the hour when once upon a time began and when one's eyes closed long before the story had ended. But I also had in mind the fact that in the old stories of our country lay the only links with our broken tradition. There has been much international traffic in folklore between India and the West through traders, travelers, gypsies, craftsmen and crusaders and many of the stories current abroad have their sources in the same springs in which these stories have been have their origin. Mulgraj Anand, 1946. And having said uh, this uh, stop quote here having uh, said all this it seems to me are we asking the crude question to ourselves is the novel essentially a Borgia individualized and western form on a western genre when you we write it in English with that question I will come to talk about Indian short stories and especially about Indian novels and Indian short stories in English Okay, uh, well, in an age of Hindu hippie hybridity, we are going through this phase now, the Hindu hippie hybridity and the glitches of defining realism, modernism and postmodernism in writing fiction is definitely a big challenge for the contemporary Indian English fiction writers or novelists. So I think about in, in the coming few minutes, uh, I will think about realism as uh, uh, the content or realism as an effect on the reader. When you read the stories written by us, the contemporary uh, story writers, when you read those, is realism a content for you or is it an effect on you? <coughs> And then I will also talk about modernism and postmodernism as periodizations and as standard classifiers. We will also think about it as writers of fiction. And then modernism and the inner self of a creative writer in the contemporary uh, Indian novel in English or Indian fiction in English scenario. Why am I trying to stick to only Indian English writing is uh, we have so many languages, uh, 22 approved languages in the Parliament of India and also we have so many folk languages, we have so many regional languages, Bhasha literatures. So if I generalize, I have the apprehension that I may do injustice to some of the languages. So I would like to stick to only English language, Indian fiction in English, I will stick to that. And then the division of the realities in modernism and postmodernism, we will talk about that. And the use of creative writing to explore extreme, uh, you know, uh, experiences in myth and folklore. When you talk about fiction, we will also talk about myth and folklore. Conventionally, there may be four types or levels of uh, meaning of the narratives: the literal or the historical meaning, then moral or ethical meanings, allegorical meanings, and uh, and and also the uh, and also the uh, analogical meanings, right? The four kinds of meanings in uh, reading and writing fiction. That we have to talk about those. Those meanings are taken. Uh, they are different from I. A. Richards' uh, definition of the meanings of uh, fiction. When I. A. Richards says that uh, there are four 
meanings or four different senses of uh, writing fiction i would quote them the first one is the sense he talks about uh, uh, the sense of fiction uh, what is actually said in any story what actually the author or the story writer or the novelist tries to say that is the sense and next is the feeling the writer's emotional attitude towards the fiction what does the writer think when he or she writes and then the next one is the uh, the tone the writer uses a specific a particular tone and uh, uh, and that is what you know we we have to focus on that and uh, we have to uh, think about that and then the intention so when uh, you talk about uh, any kind of uh, or you write any fiction there is an intention behind it you know you you also have an intention uh, for who do you write my basic question when i uh, start writing any novel or any story my basic question is what is my intention behind it am i really trying to create some kind of social mobility or this is just a piece of entertainment for me or am i just going to uh, create some kind of uh, entertainment some interesting reading for uh, some people or there is some intention behind it so uh, this is what i richard should have defined now uh, if you are a novelist if you are a writer of fiction then um, you have to also consider several kinds of criticism what kinds of criticism that Mm, uh, you would like your readers to interpret for you when they read your fiction and there can be different kinds of criticisms like uh, theoretical practical impressionistic judicial or normative mimetic problematic progressive expressive objective sociological and uh, freudian psychological psychoanalytic uh, feminine or feministic marxist interpretative interpretative or you know analytic subjective and uh, or uh, you know relativist and comparative moral and uh, jungian and archetypal and biographical there are so many types of criticisms that can get into your uh, fiction the understanding of your fiction once you have written your fiction and you leave it to, to your readers the readers can use any of these criticisms in order to understand your uh, fiction so when you write your fiction uh, try to keep these kinds of criticisms in mind and uh, uh, try to create you know uh, some kind of theoretical tool uh, or to try to emphasize some kind of theoretical tool for uh, the researchers who would be reading your stories now uh, coming to uh, the different types of uh, fictions that uh, we have been talking about uh, and and the theoretical tools that you use for the understanding and for the interpretation of fiction uh, absence you know quote on quote absence is uh, it's a term uh, from taken from french philosopher jacques derrida uh, derrida believes that uh, in any discursive uh, practice the speaker remains present but in writing the speaker is absent now when we are having this conversation i am talking to you i am present as the speaker but when it comes to creative writing the medium uh, the creative medium as writing then you i might be absent in the age of reader response uh, you are present you are reading the novel you are reading the story and you interpret the story the way you like to the way it uh, creates the feelings the thoughts in your mind so uh, there the reader is absent and uh, theoretically you know uh, another thing is uh, uh, an amnesias you know which it refers to the poets or the novelists a uh, technique of recalling the past experiences and uh, utilizing those in their works which you call uh, memory recollection and uh, nostalgia and the technique and the and the genre is called memoir like in my story collection i am just talking about the memoir uh, being god's wife where i have talked about uh, the memories of two particular characters and then i have put them across in the form of fiction for my readers and then uh, another kind another technique uh, of uh, writing a novel is anti novel 
right and thai novel is uh, amid uh, 17th century uh, new and pioneering technique um, i mean mid 20th century pioneering technique which disregards the customary uh, conventions about the fiction like describing a design creating a binary black and white like you know uh, in conventional literature or even in conventional media you will find the good and bad the black and white like you find characters sita draupadi savitri kind of good women and you find bad women like like sasupanaka okay uh, but in entire novel there is no such distinction between the good and the bad the author takes characters of flesh and blood characters like you and me the author takes women and men who have their own weaknesses their challenges their debates their issues in their lives and then they are presented not as hero or heroine but as the protagonists the protagonists are the characters who are important about whom you are talking about whom the author is talking and in entire novel uh, usually you know uh, there are a few characteristic features of the entire novel one is it generates its own kind of practicality in the plot the plot is very very practical you know it's not ideal there is no model there is no great man or woman out there who can actually create some great feelings in you even by looking at the protagonist in this kind of an entire novel you may be shocked you may be surprised that can this kind of a character be the main character in a plot but yes in the entire novel it generates its own kind of practicality in the plot and then next it attempts so to uh, to expel the reader from recognizing with the person you need not necessarily recognize yourself with the person suppose you are talking about a person who is a murderer right or who has uh, who has created something very very bad in the society but the author is creating his own justification the author has to step into the shoes of that person and then giving some kind of justification to that character then you necessarily need not recognize yourself and you need not be upset about that you need not feel sad that oh my god what kind of a character is it i could not recognize i could not identify myself with him or her you need not so that is that is entire novel now going to the ott platforms these days you see that uh, the authors the writers of the ott platforms those the series that you watch they have created anti novel characters they may be terrible in terms of the social norms but they are real characters they are flesh and blood characters then anti novel doesn't uh, cultivate any perceptive design of the plot it doesn't attempt to design any round character they can be even flat characters you need not necessarily have only round characters who were bad at one point of time then they become good and then you know all is well that ends well everything comes to an end in a very very positive note it's not necessarily like that so in entire novels you know there can be even round characters who do not change they can die but they cannot change and also they need not necessarily die they should present the realities of life and then it involves the uh, uh, the uh, recurrence of some uh, you know some comparison between the characters in that particular plot and it it employs a comprehensive study of the issues of life the existential issues of life it's a comprehensive presentation and then it offer it differs from its own time order there is no time order like aristotle would say there should be a beginning a middle and an end there need not be any particular time orders rather you know uh, uh, it can just begin any time and end any time and then it concerns itself with uh, any uh, you know inner dreams of uh, the 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 loneliness of the characters essentially every one is lonely and uh, there are so many examples of anti novels like uh, the life of life and opinions of tristram shandy that is one anti novel and also you know uh, there are uh, james joyce uh, ulysses and virginia woolf's miss 
uh, Mrs. Dalloway and uh, to the lighthouse. There are so many entire novels where you find real characters. And coming to Indian scenario, we have so many contemporary novels or contemporary uh, short stories where uh, real life characters are presented, not those ideal characters. Like, uh, uh, you know, in in folklore, in folklore research, uh, there is some there is some theoretical uh, tool called palace paradigm. Mostly in uh, classical literatures, mostly of the West, of course, the main characters were seen from above, from the palace point of view. They were ideal people. They were great men and women. They are kings and generals, and uh, that was critiqued as palace paradigm. Now, coming to contemporary literature, it has to look at the characters not from the palace point of view, but a common person's point of view. the marga and the deshi the deshi which is the folk and the marga is the classical the elite even the deshi can be a character in a novel with a grand style in folk literature in folk uh, stories in folk tales you will find that even a rickshaw puller even a person who belongs to a tribe who is not rich not grand who is not great in terms of the social uh, acceptance but that person can also be the protagonist so entire novels are coming into literature in a big way and uh, when you understand the entire novels you have to understand their structural qualities their capacity their significance organization and all those things in in a much deeper way now look at the characters of thomas hardy the characters created by thomas hardy not all of them are characters from uh, the the uh, the the palace even there are common men and women isn't it now another uh, technical term that i would like you to understand if you are writing novels is atmosphere of the mind quote and quote single quote of course uh, atmosphere of the mind the phrase was uh, devised by henry james uh, and uh, it represented the atmosphere of the mind of the author and his or her emotions and values that uh, that are transported into the minds of the reader here i am reminded the organizer uh, when she called me uh, of uh, the organizer of this program when she called me she told me that ma'am i read your uh, uh, story collection recently and then after reading your uh, memoir being god's wife i was so emotional because i could completely connect uh, with it and then i remembered my father so the atmosphere of your mind got into the atmosphere of my mind so if you are a novelist if you are writing fiction then you have to also take care of that that you create an atmosphere in your mind in your pen when you write so that when it is transported when it gets into uh, the mind of uh, the reader similar effect is created isn't it and uh, the idea of the death of the author is also very very important uh, as a writer of a novel you should understand that it was first vocalized by rolla barthes in the essay the death of the author in 1968 and then by foucault in his essay what is an author and both of them view that uh, the author is uh, uh, in fact uh, you know a, a the reader is important and the author is suppressed the author is invisible once the novel or once the fiction the the text comes to the hands of the reader if the reader confronts the text understands it at liberty and then interprets then accepts that uh, what he likes and then uh, he thinks about the author in his own terms the author is not exactly what you are but the author is what the reader makes of you the author is what the reader imagines you to be the author is an imaginary being and uh, the reader if the the reader is very much real a book is born only when a reader reads it carefully otherwise the book dies a natural death and it applies to fiction uh, as well if you write a story if you write a novel the novel or the story or the characters are born only when a sensitive reader reads the characters and appreciates them or a sensitive reader identifies 
connects with the universality of the character that you have created through your fiction and uh, uh, what the reader is also authentic since he or she interprets the text with autonomy the reader has the autonomy the reader has an identity an autonomy to create a character that actually you think that you have created when i write a story i might have conceived the character differently but when it goes to the hands of the readers the character may completely go through a change of his or her presentation or his or her you see you see character you know the reader can completely change him or her and uh, uh, what the reader comprehends of the text is the ultimate meaning of the text now another kind of novel that uh, i come across uh is uh, epic novels you know epic novel is the most in the most traditional sense it is uh, it is a sizably long narrative poem or even a novel and uh, it's pronounced uh, in a very uh, serious issue and uh, written in a conspicuous manner with grand style with grand feelings having uh, protagonists who are superhumans or super warriors or heroes and epic novels are uh, so many in india these days in the indian knowledge system if you look into uh, the world of fiction you will find that uh, many people are taking characters from the ramayana the mahabharat and then rewriting those characters and they are creating epic novels the epic narrative is polygonal and uh, uh, it is it integrates folk tales antiquity mythologies legends fables and uh, it has implications in the form of uh, you know the narrative uh, uh, sub genres like uh, you look at our ramayan mahabharat and then you look at iliad odyssey gilgamesh of beowulf cenewulf and then you know Dan- uh, divine comedy and th- so those kind of texts even paradise lost so these are epic poetry and epic novels and even moby dick and war and peace so they are also epic novels and james joyce's ulysses i consider that as a part of our epic novels isn't it and uh, uh, now uh, we have also in the in the world of uh, uh, feminist literature we have gynocritical texts now gynocriticism is different from feminism uh, the term is borrowed from uh, gynek which means uh, the, the the greek word uh gyi any gyne which means woman and then uh criticism k r i t i s m so that means judgment so women's judgments so gynocritical texts are uh, essentially uh texts written by women on women's issues but feminism can be different even men write feministic texts they talk about women's issues uh, however uh, gynocriticism is very very different it's about women writing on women's issues another kind of uh, uh, text uh, in the world of fiction is uh, hyper text hyper text conventionally it's a cre- it's a creative text and it's explicit it has a beginning a middle and an end it's a it's a hyper text and it doesn't alter you can never change a hypertext there is no alteration once written it remains forever and uh, well it's actually the other way around a hypertext is uh, something very very modern and uh, it's subject to change and a hypertext can change with age with period with time with people here i am reminded about walt whitman who said that a text is always a work in progress he said that i can write my text leaves uh, of grass you know uh, every year i can write uh, uh, one more version of the text and he kept on adding uh, more lines to that text and uh, uh, the text went on uh, uh, being uh, being edited new things added and unnecessary things edited for a long period of time and how i wish that we had that liberty of uh, forever writing a hyper text a text which is in progress throughout your life 
when i wrote my poetry book sita a few years ago uh, and then, then when i look at sita i want to add something more to that i want to edit i want to uh, you know uh, uh, create some more uh, agendas there i want to have some more critical engagement there i wish we had that freedom of creating a hypertext but hypertexts are also discussed uh, a lot these days and many writers are getting into that genre so if you are a novelist maybe you can consider writing a hypertext take that liberty of course in consultation with your publisher and uh, now another thing uh, in uh, the pretty critical pedagogy of fiction is metafiction and the implied author the term metafiction was introduced by uh, robert scholes and it is often used as an equivalent of uh, sar fiction s u r sar fiction so fiction and it symbolizes the category of uh, the novel where the role of the author and the reader in inventing and receiving the fiction uh, are interchangeable so in meta means beyond so metafiction means understanding fiction beyond fiction understanding the novel beyond the novelist's desires so fiction about fiction and uh, that openly comments on its own fictional status is also a part of uh, metafiction now look at midnight children that is a part of your metafiction or even 100 years of solitude that's also a part of metafiction and why do i call that a part of metafiction is you know uh, in the midnight children you know the author uh, the novelist he he talks about uh, uh, india's independence on uh, uh, 46 and uh, no, no 1947 midnight uh, 15th august and then the plot goes on to uh, the, the 1970s to the emergency and then he talks about the growth of an entire civilization in the post independent india similarly in uh, in 100 years of solitude uh, the author marquis he talks about uh, the growth and development of the world civilization for 100 years over the period of 100 years so so many changes come there so many narratives are there so many complicated so many complex and layered multi layered stories and plots are there so metafiction is something really interesting and one has to understand metafiction in order to create fiction if you are a novelist please do understand metafiction read more about it and uh, try to uh, write metafiction now the next uh, i would like to uh, uh, touch upon would be slice of life novel slice of life like a slice of bread hmm. uh, it's a it's a uh, naturalistic kind of uh, novel uh, that uh, narrates the uh, five points of reality uh, of life and uh, the small parts of life so for example you take a slice or a piece or an incident from the mahabharat and then you create a narrative of your own out of that and uh, in the slice of life novels the story time and the text time are different they do not stick to the time frame that aristotle would have prescribed a beginning middle and an end rather in the slice of life novels the story time refers to the period that is the most essential uh, requisite of uh, the actions of the story to take place that is the story time and the text time is uh, on the other hand uh, the, the text time is embodied in the understanding of the text by the reader so when you write you know attempt slice of life novel uh, understand the layers of the story uh, and then going back and forth like some nostalgia some recollection going to the past then coming to the present and making it relevant to the present as well and this is a big challenge uh, slice of life novel and you have to read more about it in case you attempt to write slice of life novels now next is uh, you know a string of pearls narrative string of pearls beads like this you know there are beads and pearls and uh, i have taken this uh, from jeremy hathorn he explains string of pearls narrative like uh, quote uh, a narrative that uh, consists of a number of relatively or uh, completely uh, unrelated episodes uh, taken strung together by a thin thread so uh, 
absurd like you had uh, you know the, the theater of the absurd you can compare string of pearls narrative or string of pearls novels to the to the uh, absurd theater as well where you know disconnected disjointed incidents are taken together and they are strung together by a thin thread and then ultimately the thread may consist of uh, uh, some sequence or a person or an individual character or whatever otherwise known as episodic narrative now this reminds me of again the ott platforms these days that you watch uh, in the episodes there will be characters uh, maybe there is one character who gets into each episode in some or other capacity he may or may not be very important to each plot but ultimately you discover that uh, uh, he or she is very very important and uh, and then you know uh, that gives a lot of importance uh, the, the plot gives a lot of importance to that particular character and uh, and then uh, it he he makes the plot complete isn't it a uh, novel has always been associated with uh, again a travel now travelogues are very very important these days people are writing uh, you know road literature or travel literature road narratives recently i received a phd thesis from somebody where the title is uh, road narrative so uh, starting with don quixote cervantes's character don quixote how he had the wanderlust he traveled so much and then till the contemporary english uh, novels where travel is a pedagogy and if you want to write travel uh, narratives then you have to travel a lot the best way of gaining knowledge is traveling indeed isn't it so travel a lot and then you find out your own narratives and your own stories and uh, there are many kinds of uh, uh, writings many uh, many kinds of narratives that uh, that should come to your mind when you try to write uh, a progressive narrative isn't it a progressive story ultimately when you get into fiction as your creative genre you have to write progressive literature something very contemporary something very progressive something that can engage the human mind otherwise it will become like a documentary and uh, your reader may lose interest in it so when it is fiction it has to be interesting and it has to be progressive narrative to quote mckain now if you uh, uh, to if you want to write uh, fiction successfully then there are a few things that you should consider uh, before i conclude i would just take the key words or the most important points that we discussed about writing fiction like uh, uh, some 25 26 points i will take uh, down now and uh, i would also request you to take your pens and jot down the important points so that we can discuss those during your question hour and uh, also in your assignments we can talk about those uh, the narrative technique for fiction writers all these narrative techniques that we discussed discussed now uh, they are important and what are the narrative techniques is equally important uh, the narrative techniques uh, number one to me would be create the setting in your story or in your novel you create a setting for yourself an atmosphere or a setting for yourself and then you talk about uh, uh, you incorporate you know foreshadowing not now what is foreshadowing it's a way to provide hints about events in a story before they happen so before uh, you write the real story before you talk about the characters uh, uh, in the real sense you uh, you foreshadow or you create foreshadowing by giving some hints about it and uh, uh, amitabh ghosh he he does foreshadowing a lot in his novels if you just read the first phase you will get some hint about uh, the the upcoming incidents or the events so foreshadowing is very very important then play around sensory imagery imagery metaphor they are extremely important you should play around those and then uh, think about uh, cliffhan hanger now what's a cliffhan hanger it describes an ending of a story uh, and what we thought information about a narrative so open ended maybe it's a short story do not conclude leave it open ended for your reader to to find some conclusion of his choice that is also possible and then uh, shifting chronology back and forth going forward going back 
and thinking about the past and coming to the present so lot of things are there uh, in a chronology so shifting chronology is equally important and then importance of a point of view now a lot of people are talking about pov point of view in your story you create your point of view and uh, leave it to your reader also to create his or her own point of view like uh, uh, i told earlier that a author an author is born only when a reader reads him or her carefully isn't it so allow the reader to create his or her, her own point of view then integrate uh, the character's voice your character should have a voice so integrate that and uh, do not create weak characters uh, do not uh, try to avoid very flat characters uh, round characters uh, who have a point of view uh, and you in try to integrate that and symbolism the language of literature is the language of symbolism be a master of symbolism create your own imagery your own symbolism and then you know concentrate on uh, the variable narrators Uh, a variable narrator is uh, typically a person who can divert the mind of the attention of the reader uh, from focusing on uh, the the key suspect like in the gothic novels uh, a person might appear like a ghost might appear like a mysterious character and the reader's mind will be attentive towards that particular character whereas at the end you discover that the real mystery or the ghost was somebody else isn't it so create that kind of variables in the narrative and then involve the readers in the story and record uh, of his stream of consciousness consciousness is very very important you should import you should take your reader to a frame of mind to a state of mind uh, through the stream of consciousness that, that you create and personification is very very important you use lot of phenomenon from the nature from the flora and fauna and personify them if necessary and then try to add some surprise elements in the plot without surprise elements it becomes uh, redundant and use of satire and parody use of poetic prose and uh, use of metaphors and similes and uh, use of uh, you know uh, uh, you know you know use of philosophical thoughts is very very important reserve your plot neatly the plot should have neatness uh do not try to complicate the plots too much otherwise after reading a first few pages the readers may not like to go further and in the world of cacophony everyone has a voice the politicians the students the teachers the the activists uh, the homemakers stood everyone has a voice so in the midst of so much of a cacophony uh if you are able to create an euphonic voice through your fiction a uh, euphonic voice who is powerful who is strong who has a point of view then probably you are going to survive otherwise your novel will die a natural death your fiction will die a natural death and nobody will read it and uh, to create interest in your readers you have to really work hard on the character and uh, sometimes like to create suspense you can uh, start your story in the middle of it and then uh, you know uh, a narrative within a narrative a story within a story like shakespearean theater had a theater within a theater so you can also use it you can use a hyperbole you can use some poetry inside pro prose and uh, you can use the author surrogacy now who is the author surrogacy uh, the author uh, has to enter into the plot sometimes like if you are the author you may not be the protagonist but in between if you can enter and talk in first person point of view or maybe name yourself you take your name somewhere and be present in the plot briefly then also it creates some interest in the readers and then the use of allegory the use of alliteration assonance and uh, the use of all those literary devices will make your uh, story technically sound your fiction will be technically sound and uh, y- your novel is going to be very very interesting for people and uh, with with these things in your mind if you start writing your novel uh, then probably your novels are going to be very interesting and readable and uh, maybe you will get a lot of attention as a writer or if not attention at least satisfaction as a writer because ultimately you know if your book is worth reading ultimately you know if your novel is interesting and you know how your readers will find it 
writing is a big challenge many people are writing these days it's a big challenge uh, try to enjoy your writing try to enjoy your trade try to enjoy the creation of your characters pour yourself into the characters and uh, live the characters you know when i write a story or when i write a novel the characters follow me everywhere they go to the kitchen with me they go to the room with me they go to my university with me they go to the library with me they follow me everywhere i can't live without them they become a part of my life until and unless i am satisfied that i have given justice to them i have created them in a more justifiable manner until i am satisfied they follow me everywhere my thoughts resonate with their thoughts i wake up in the middle of the night and i think about my characters and sometimes i think oh my god i am not doing justice with my characters i talk to them i live life with them so maybe this is one way of enjoying your life giving a meaning to your life that you create characters who are instrumental in social change people read books and they change their lives at least i would say that in my case my life changed by reading books and then i decided that i should also try to create characters who will touch lives who will change lives meaningful changes positive and inclusive changes in the lives of many people through the creation of my fictional characters I enjoy writing both poetry and fiction. I find meaning in both of them. But then before I write anything, before I try to create poetry or create fiction, I read hundreds of them. A, only a good reader can be a good writer. So I would stop here with a simple advice to all of us including me and you that let's be great readers first before we try to become good writers and exchange of thoughts reading each other's fiction and poetry giving feedback and suggestion should be the first step towards it so let's conclude it here and now the session is open for discussions and i invite your questions and your suggestions and uh, in case you are a good writer also please send me your poetry and your fiction for reading and publication uh, i am here to facilitate i am here to help you out with your publication undoubtedly uh, thank you so much